whole tree grows. Yeah, I'm like that. A song of encouragement 356 after the preaching. 356. It was suggested by a good brother that we sing this song again. You remember from last week? Somebody's giving the baby something real sticky to eat. <laughs> the servant song. You remember the song? Sing with me. Lord, make me a servant. Lord, make me like you. For you are a servant. Make me one too. Lord, make me a servant. Do what you must do to make me a servant, make me like you. I think you remembered. I couldn't help but think that very few subjects bring about as much confusion as a subject of what many people in the, wor in the world, religious world, call the Christian Sabbath. A lot of people believe that there are two different types of laws that were given in the Old Testament. One was the moral laws. Now the moral laws were the Ten Commandments. It's how we were to morally live towards God and how we were to morally live towards other people. Worship only God, not make any images. But then he talks about your treatment of other people. Do not covet, do not steal, do not kill, commit murder. And those are known as the, the moral laws of the Old Testament. And then on the other hand, you have what are referred to as the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament. And we've been studying on Wednesday evenings quite a bit about these ceremonial laws, have we not? The making of the tabernacle, what it was to be made out of, how it was to be made, the different uh, instruments that were to be found within the tabernacle itself, even the clothing of the priest, that was all ceremonial stuff. And so there are many people in the religious world that say, well, there were ceremonial laws in the Old Testament and there were moral laws, the Ten Commandments, in the Old Testament. And they believe that whenever Jesus died upon the cross that He took away the ceremonial laws, but those moral laws remain. And indeed, would, would, would this be some place if we didn't have some kind of moral law? But are the moral laws we're bound by today those that were brought forward from the Old Testament? That's, that's the question. Moses stayed on the mount receiving the laws from God for a period of 40 days. And during those 40 days, God gave him those Ten Commandments and so many other laws under which the Jews were to live. Well, some people teach that the Sabbath day has not changed. In other words, some people do believe that Saturday is still the day that is to be the day of worship. When I was a youngster growing up in the small town of Jackson, Ohio, we met on Sunday morning in the Seventh-day Adventist church building. And we weren't Seventh-day seven -day Adventists, we were members of the Church of Christ. But the Adventists used the building on Saturday because they believed that was the day that one was still to worship God. And then we would rent it on Sundays and use it as a place for us to worship. 
the Sabbath day. Other people teach that the Sabbath day has been changed from Saturday, which was the Jewish day of rest, to Sunday, making Sunday the day of rest and worship and applying the Sabbath laws to this day. That the laws pertaining to the Old Testament Sabbath were important is very evident in the Word of God. In fact, there's at least six different times in the Old Testament, particularly in the book of Exodus, where God commands that that, that, that sixth day, that sa or seventh day, that Sabbath day, be kept. It is to be observed. Beginning in Exodus 16, when God provided manna, that, 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 that white bread that would be on the ground like dew in the mornings, and the people would get out and gather it. God said that you will gather that for six days of the week, but on the seventh day, on the Sabbath day, it was not to be gathered. Rather, you gathered enough on the sixth day to last over the seventh. In Exodus chapter 20, during the giving of the Ten Commandments, God says in verses 8 through 10, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. So time and again in the Old Testament, God commanded the keeping of this Old Testament law. In fact, keeping the law of the Sabbath was so important that if one broke the Sabbath law, death was to be the penalty. In Exodus 31 and verse 15, God speaks to Moses and He says to him, Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. So there can be no doubt in our minds that the Jewish nation was to keep and observe the laws pertaining to the Sabbath as commanded by God. Not only back in the days of Exodus, but in the days when Jesus, the Savior, walked upon this earth, the Sabbath laws were to be observed. And even yet today, the Jewish people observe the Sabbath day. Well, getting back to the idea that some people teach the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament have been taken away when Jesus died on the cross, but the Ten Commandments are still binding upon us yet today. Let's consider what sacred text tells us. Remember that some teach, we said that some teach and believe that when the words the Old Testament law are mentioned, they don't include the Ten Commandments. Well, let's, let's consider this. We're going to be studying from Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul is writing, in verses 1 through 6, Paul emphasizes that the Jews today, or people today, are no longer bound under that Old Testament law. In fact, the passage says there in Romans chapter 7, that just as a wife is bound to her husband, as long as the husband lives, so the Jews were bound under that Old Testament law as long as it was in effect. However, he says, once Christ brought the New Testament into effect, then the Jews were no longer bound under that Old Testament law of Moses. And then we read in Romans 7 and verse 7, Paul writes and says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Well, God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. It's almost as if that verse were specifically made for those who say that the ceremonial laws are no longer binding, but the Ten Commandments still are. 
Because Paul answers that question once for all here in verse 7. You get that, what he says? The Bible says here there's no distinction between those ceremonial laws, the making of the tabernacle and so forth, and the Ten Commandments. How do we know this? Well, we just read that one would not know lust except the law said thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not covet was one of the Ten Commandments. One of the Ten Commandments. We can't separate the Ten Commandments from any other of the Old Testament laws. All of the Old Testament laws, whether if they be ceremonial laws or whether if they be the Ten Commandments, they've all been removed by the death of Jesus Christ upon that old rugged cross. We read in Ephesians 2.15, having abolished in His flesh the enmity. Who are they talking about? Talking about Jesus having abolished in His flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in Himself of twain one new man, so making peace. So let's conclude that Jesus has taken away not only the ceremonial laws under which the Jews were led, but also took away the Ten Commandments. Thus, we conclude, we have to, conclude that we're no more under the Ten Commandments than we are under the laws pertaining to the construction of the tabernacle or the animal sacrifices that were ordered to be offered up under the Old Testament. The word Sabbath itself. The word Sabbath is an English word. It comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat. It originally meant to desist from labor or to rest. Sounds good to me. If you look up the word Sabbath in a lexicon, however, you're going to find that the definition of Sabbath is seventh, seventh day. And indeed, to the Jews, the seventh day of the week, or Saturday, was a day of rest. Why was it a day of rest? Well, to find the answer, we go all the way back. We go clear back to Genesis chapter 2. Verse 3, there we're able to find after God had made everything that He made during that week of creation, the Bible says, and on the seventh day God ended His work which He had made, and He rested on the seventh day from all the work which He had made. There is no indication whatsoever that Adam ever kept the Sabbath or that Abraham ever kept the Sabbath, or that Noah ever kept the Sabbath, or as far as that goes, that any of the patriarchs ever kept the Sabbath. It was not until the law was given on Mount Sinai that there was any command given concerning the keeping of the Sabbath or a day of rest. Genesis 2 and verse 3 simply tells us that eventually... The Sabbath day is going to be based upon the fact that on the seventh day of creation, God rested. Have you ever considered what those Sabbath day commands were? As mentioned earlier in the lesson, according to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 10, no work was to be performed. Now Alvin Mead will tell you that not only are there laws that were given in the Old Testament, but there are also... Uh, many, well, we will call them Jewish traditions that were kept. And the Jewish people had tradition, the Jewish fathers, patriarchs, the, the leaders had uh, traditions that they had come up with concerning work on the Sabbath. They had 39 different categories of work that was not to be done on the Sabbath day. Those categories included planting crops, plowing fields, reaping crops, binding sheaves together, threshing, winnowing, kneading, kneading bread, baking, shearing or washing wool, weaving, slaughtering, curing hides, writing, lighting a fire, and many more. 
that they had as traditions. You know, if we were bound by that law of Moses, couldn't wash the car, could we? Couldn't work for a living if that meant working on the Sabbath day or Saturday. Those who have jobs that demand that they work on that day would not be permitted to work upon that day. But there was an exception given. You remember what the exception was? If you performing an act that saved the life of another, animal or human, then you were permitted to work on that day. If your animal fell in a ditch or if grandma tripped and fell, you could pick her up or get the animal out of that ditch. There was another prohibition that was given on the Saturday or the Sabbath. Exodus 16 and verse 19. 29, I'm sorry. The Bible says, Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. Hence we get the phrase, Sabbath day's journey. That's where it came from. The distance a person could travel on the Sabbath day. In Acts chapter 1, the apostles have witnessed the ascension of the precious Lord from earth up into the clouds to be received back into heaven. And after witnessing this great event, the Bible says in Acts 1 and verse 12, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Now the Mount of Olives was about 3,100 feet or seven-tenths of a mile from the city of Jerusalem. That was the maximum distance a person could travel from their home under the law of Moses on that special day. People attempted to bypass that law two ways. If you were rich and you owned a home on this side of town, then you could buy a home on the other side of town and you could travel from here to here. That would keep you within the seven-tenths of a mile. And then you would be permitted to travel seven-tenths of a mile from that second home that you own. That was, that was one way to get around it. If you weren't really rich, but you could have a little bit of food, the Jews eventually got to the point where they said, anywhere you have your food can be considered as your domicile or your home. And so on, on Friday they would go and they would put pieces of food in various places throughout the city and as long as they stayed within seven-tenths of a mile of where that food was, they considered themselves to be within the law of, of Moses. Uh, there was a third prohibition on the Sabbath day and that was the making of fire. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 35 and verse 3, You shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. According to the Word of God in Numbers 15, 32 through 36, While the children of Israel were in the wilderness, there was a man who was found who was gathering sticks to build a fire. The ones who found this man brought him to Moses and Aaron. Moses and Aaron at the moment did not know what to do with the man and so they had him put in hold. They had him placed in some kind of a detention facility until it could be determined what should be done to him. Numbers 15.35 says the Lord spoke to Moses concerning this and proclaimed that the man who had gathered sticks on the Sabbath day was to be put to death and was to be put to death by stoning. Thus the nation of Israel took him outside the camp and put this man to death. So while gathering sticks for a fire was contrary to God's will, even building a fire upon the Sabbath day violated the law of God. One of the things that we have to realize, we have to, who was the Sabbath law given to? Many think that the Ten Commandments are given for us yet today, but you know, God, God has made covenants with people that only dealt with those people. Let me give an example. 
In the book of Genesis chapter 17, God speaks to Abraham. And God makes a covenant with Abraham. Anybody remember what that covenant was? The covenant was the covenant of circumcision. On the eighth day, your male child shall be circumcised, and this shall be a sign that that child belongs to me. It was a covenant between God and the nation of Israel. Gentiles? Gentiles were left out. They were not a part of that covenant whatsoever. It was only a covenant that was made between God and the nation of Israel. It was not to all the people on the earth, only to the Jews. Let me suggest to you that whenever God gave the Ten Commandments through Moses to the nation of Israel, those Ten Commandments were given only to, only to the Jewish people. They were not commands that were given to any non-Jewish people. Do you realize the early church was never commanded to meet on the Sabbath? Now, we have to realize there's a difference between the Sabbath and the first day of the week, Sunday. Matthew chapter 28, Jesus is, has been in the tomb for three days. The ladies have got up and they're going to go to the tomb in order to properly prepare the body of Jesus for that, that final burial. Of course, when they get there, they find out the tomb's empty. But the Bible says in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 1 that upon the first day of the week, I'm sorry, as it, as, as it, uh, let me get it perfect. Let me get it perfect. In the end of the Sabbath, in the end of the Sabbath, the Sabbath was coming to an end, right? The end of the Sabbath. As it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. The Sabbath ended the first day of the week. There's a difference. The Sabbath is not the first day. There's a difference between the two. The Sabbath was the seventh day, which is Saturday. First day of the week is Sunday. Yeah. The early church was never commanded to meet on the Sabbath, always on the first day of the week, Sunday. Do we find the early Christians meeting for worship as our example to follow today? Yes, we do. What day was it? The first day of the week, Sunday. Now, I'm not saying that the early evangelists, including the Apostle Paul, didn't go to the synagogues on Saturday, but the Bible makes it very plain why they did go. They went because at the synagogue on the Sabbath day on Saturday, there would be a crowd of people gathered. And guess what the preachers would do? They'd preach to them. Because here was a crowd of people that they could preach the gospel of Christ to. It was an opportunity to preach the resurrected Jesus. We do find in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 that the early church gathered together on the first day of the week in order to commune together upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. We do find that the early church gave of their means financially for the work of the Lord's church in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Paul says, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. It was even on the first day of the week that John received the revelation from Jesus himself. And it's in the verse in Revelation where that day is referred to as the Lord's day. There is one time, one time in the Word of God where we can refer this to the Christian Sabbath. It's found in Hebrews chapter 4. The Hebrew writer is going back to the example of Joshua. You remember Joshua, the one who took the place of Moses. Joshua being able to lead the nation of Israel into that promised land. And once they got to the promised land, they fought for the promised land, and they won the promised land. And after they had won the promised land, guess what they had? They had rest. They had rest. Isn't that what Sabbath means? It means rest? Rest? Yeah. Whenever the Jews finally came into the promised land and they defeated the people who lived there, 
they then had rest. When well, Hebrews chapter 4, the writer compares this with a Christian who faithfully lives a life here upon this earth and will finally make it to the rest that we all await in heaven. In the book of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 9, we're able to read, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. There remains a Sabbath. That's what the word rest is, Sabbath, to the people of God. Notice what is said in Revelation 14, 13. Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Listen, don't we want that eternal rest? Don't we want it from the troubles of this life? Don't we want that eternal rest only made available through the blood of our precious Lord? The blood of Christ will wash our sins away. Acts 22.16 and now why tarriest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. This morning, if you're not a child of God, you can be baptized for the remission of your sins. Go faithfully through that life. And then when this life is over, guess what we got? We got that rest. That, that, that one Christian rest. Promise to those that faithfully complete the Christian's race. Lesson is yours. It is our hope that if you're here today subject to the invitation, that you will come forward while today we and this hour we stand and while we sing. Jesus is tenderly calling thee home, calling today, calling today.